Hello everyone. If you're a regular or new, welcome. Some of us today have gathered together and other of us are still online. But we've all come for a common purpose and that is to meet with the risen Lord Jesus. Today we'll praise our great God with music and lyrics, Bible reading and prayer. The theme today is growth and sin. As we reflect on the prodigal son who abused the good nature of his father and the father's willingness to welcome his son back into the family, I hope that we come to realise the greatness of God the Father and his love toward those who can acknowledge their sin and their constant need of his forgiveness. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Kids Spot. What is your favourite animal in the whole world? Hmm, that is a tricky question, isn't it? Mine is a dog. And this is my dog. This is Pippa. She's a West Highland Terrier. And she's pretty cute, but she doesn't really like being held like this at the moment. Let me just pop her down. Well, it can be pretty tough to choose a favourite animal, can't it? Do you choose an animal that's fierce and strong like a lion or a crocodile? Do you choose an animal that's really smart, like an elephant or a dolphin? Or do you choose an animal that's really cute, like a kitten or a duck? Emily Daly. Well, the Bible tells us that when God created the world, he created all of the animals as well. And he did a pretty good job, didn't he? Those animals in our world are pretty interesting and pretty unique. One animal that I always think of as being very unusual and very unique is an octopus. Have you ever seen a video of an octopus swimming through the ocean? All those tentacles, and it can even change colour so it blends in with the scenery around it. Pretty cool. Well, God didn't just create the animals to be special and unique. He created us to be special and unique too. In fact, in this Bible, in Psalm 139, it tells us that God had a special plan for us when he put us together in our mum's tummies. He had a plan for what we would be like and some of the things that we would be really good at. I wonder, though, how often do we spend time thanking God and praising God for making us to be, well, us? Sometimes we can spend quite a bit of time thinking about, what we want to be better at or what we would rather be like. But remember that God has made you with a special plan and we're going to sing about that now. All right, kids. We're going to sing If I Were Butterflies, so don't forget to get your actions ready um, for all of the animals that we're going to sing about. So let's go. If I were I were a robin in a tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. And if I were a fish in the sea, I'd wriggle my tail and I'd giggle with thee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just If 
my word and yet from the down I thank you Lord for my big smile And in my word a fuzzy wuzzy bear I thank you Lord for my fuzzy wuzzy bear And I just thank you Father for making me new Oh you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile You gave me Jesus and you made me your child Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your unique and amazing creation. And in particular, Lord, we want to thank you for the different gifts and abilities that you give each and every one of us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to use these gifts and abilities to bring glory to you and to help other people get to know you too. We thank you for this world that you have given to us. Please help us to look after it uh, and to be good stewards of your creation. Amen. Have a great week. On behalf of the Women's Committee, I'm excited to be able to invite the women of St John's and St Mark's to a special women's event on Saturday the 15th of August. 
I think we can all agree that the past few months have been a fairly challenging time for many of us as we face the uncertainty and difficulties associated with COVID-19. On Saturday the 15th of August we're going to be hearing from Cara Hartley who is the Archdeacon for Women's Ministry in the Sydney Diocese. She's going to be speaking to us from the book of Nehemiah and talking about how we can honour God in challenging times. Well during our day together there will be time for prayer, discussions as well as sitting together under God's word. There will be an opportunity for fellowship, food and fun and in the afternoon there will be a range of activities that people can choose from depending on what they'd like to do. Registration forms are available online via the church Facebook page, digitally along with the church newsletter and paper copies are available at each service at St John's. Further details for the event are available in the registration form or you can speak to a member of the Women's Committee which is myself, Renee Gowing, Sandra Daly, Lynn Rogers and Wendy McLean. Good morning, we've come to a time of prayer where we approach our Heavenly Father, our God who loves us, loves us so much that he was prepared to sacrifice his son to save us and he not only says we can but he insists that we keep in communication with him through Bible reading and prayer and that's what we're going to do now as a, as a community we're going to pray so will you join me dear Lord forgive us for the things we have thought said and done this week that have grieved you and caused a strain in relationship with you and one another we know Lord that there is nothing we can do in our own strength that will make us right with you so we throw ourselves on your proven mercy and grace Please forgive us, Lord. And Father, it is with confidence that we come before you because of your character and nature revealed in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. When we think through your salvation plan set in motion right back at the time of the Garden of Eden, we wonder at your patience and your love as we enjoy the benefits of the sacrifice and resurrection of your Son, Jesus. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wonderful life that you give us here in this country. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy because of our, our political system which allows us to elect those who represent us in the parliaments. How reassuring it is to know that these places of decision making are subject to your will. We thank you too, Father, for those who minister the word full time in our church. For our Archbishop Glenn Davies and for Bishop Gary Koo. We thank you for the ministry team for the work they are doing. We thank you for all that Rosemary and Barry have done in the past and they continue to do for the next couple of weeks. We pray for James and Renee and Hayden and all of them as they lead our parish. How great it is to know that all who minister do so in partnership with you, Lord. We thank you for answered prayer. As we remember the times that we have seen direct answers to prayers, may that reassure us firstly that you hear when we pray. And secondly, that your fatherly love moves you to act on our behalf. Help us to bring everything before you in confidence. We thank you for the way in which you not only love us and have provided that great gift of salvation in Jesus, but also that you provide all that we need to live day by day. We want to pray for those who are in authority in our land, Father, and particularly for all the government ministers and members of the judiciary, as they seek to serve our nation. May they be instruments of your love and will in decisions that they make. May they do their work for impartial and fair outcomes. Help those who are Christians in these positions to be bold for you. We pray for those people in the armed forces, for police, firefighters, doctors, nurses and ambulance drivers, for the SES, and all the other organisations where people sign up to do the dangerous things that keep us safe. We pray that you may protect them as they perform their duties. May they do it with courage and integrity, seeking only to serve. Help us to give them the honour and respect that they deserve. Please move by your spirit the, the hearts of all world leaders, that they may be concerned to do your will, and so bring a more peaceful situation to those areas that are suffering war civil unrest or natural disasters and we particularly pray this morning Father that you would be with the situation between the USA and, and China and uh, also 
China and Australia. Help to uh, quieten that down, Father, we pray, so that the threat of uh, military action is taken away. We pray, Father, that you will help us to encourage each other as we do the work of the Kingdom. We especially today pray today for boldness in proclaiming the Gospel. Equip and strengthen those who hear your calling to serve and help us all to do it with joy. And we want to pray, Lord, for individuals and families struggling with issues of sickness or recovery from sickness or grief at this time. We pray, Lord, that they may make Jesus their strength and refuge. We want to pray for particular issues. We thank you that uh, the online method of communication, be it Zoom or recordings, has worked so well, and uh, particularly for Wei, and we pray that, um, that, 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 that that may continue and have been benefit where it's, where it's been necessary. May continue where it's been necessary. We pray for our society that has been adversely affected by COVID-19, that Christians everywhere will continue to be God's instrument by showing his love and caring and helping where we can. I want to pray for those people who were elected at the annual vestry meeting last Sunday, Father. Um, may they be ready to serve and may they be ready to uh, guide and direct the parish as they discuss the various issues that arise. We pray for Barry and Rosemary and their families that God will give them strength in all that has to be done and for James and Renee and their family that you would watch over them during these hard times, Father. And we pray for Hayden, that you would provide his needs and protect him, especially at the present time. And Father, we pray for the missionaries, for the McCarthys, for Malcolm and Leanne and Judith Carth. Wherever they are, may they be effective in whatever role you call them to perform. Pray that they may be conscious of our prayers and support. And may they be encouraged to know that you care for them and will provide for them. Finally, Lord, we pray for our witness of the love of Jesus. May we demonstrate that we belong to you by loving as Jesus did. Help us to maintain our commitment no matter what life may bring us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 15 and I'll be reading from verses 11 through to 30. Luke chapter 15. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went off and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, 
All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Here ends the reading. No one wants to talk about their failures, whether it's your pride standing in the way or you're afraid of the consequences. Who remembers what happened on the 1st of January 1996? It was only the most spectacular finish in Australian cricket history. To set the scene, Australia versus the West Indies. Four runs required, one ball remaining, one wicket remaining, with Michael Bevan on strike. The crowd was on the edge of their, their seats, or I think they were. I wasn't there. I was watching on TV. I'd planned to go to that game, but I was sitting in my lounge room. Why? Uh, because I ate KFC the night before. Who would have thought that six pieces of KFC chicken would give a 12-year-old the runs? How could something that looks so nice and sweet have such a detrimental effect? I fail to see how chicken could constrain you to a toilet seat six times in one day. But it happened, and I missed the warm embrace of glory as Michael Bevan hit the final ball for four runs and won the game for Australia. That day, the crowd exploded with a noise. So did I, but of a different kind. As the smoke cleared and I reflected on that terrible day, I learned something. I learned never to eat KFC again if I really wanted to go somewhere. But to be serious now, out of the depths of despair, I learned that you could learn through failure. I saw the error of my ways and after that, I tried to run f from it and never do it again. In chapter 11 of his book, uh, John talks about something that seems wrong. Can our sin and foolishness grow us? How can that be? If that sounds strange, I'm with you there. But when you hear John explain it, you begin to get it, how it works. Uh, sin should mean that we're punished by God, put in jail with the key never to be seen again. But this is not how God wills or works. We have an amazing Father helping us grow up as his children and like our brother Jesus. He can and does even bend sin and its consequences in the direction of his glorious plans. And so what we and others mean for evil, God means for good. Can poison turn nutritious? Can a leopard change its spots? God's answer is yes. Even our sin can grow us into the Jesus-shaped us that God wants us to be, if we look at it rightly. Let's pray before we continue, though. Uh, please join with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your patience through Jesus Christ and for the help of your Holy Spirit, helping us to be more like him. Help us to understand how sin can grow us, and we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now I come to my first point, how to grow through failure. We need to avoid sin, but we also need to see how we can learn from our sins and when we're foolish. Jesus explains this in his parable about the father and his two sons in Luke's gospel, reading Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not sure if I'd ever do this myself. Uh, seems a bit foolish, but... One of the sons asks his father for his share of his wealth. It's as if he says to his father, I wish you were dead. Really? 
that son leaves home and then makes a meal of his entire fortune. He finds himself out of cash just as a famine hits and he needs a job and he finds one feeding pigs. This son was far from home, living recklessly and feeling desperate. Then it dawns on him, reading Luke chapter 15, verses 17 to 20. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. He begins to understand the difference of being in his father's presence and being far from and out of step with his father. This is most clear when on his return, his father doesn't wait for his excuses or his groveling. This father ran and embraced him. Thinking that his father might disown him, he does the opposite. He acts as if he is part of the family. This is a riches to rags to riches story with the happiest ending possible. He's back home appreciating his father's kindness in welcoming him back even though he had strayed away from him. But what leads to this astounding finish where the son comes home to enjoy his father's love in this new and right way? Well, the son sees his sin for what it is as something sinful and makes the journey home he comes to his senses while he's in the gutter and this helps him understand how far he's fallen and he longs for home sweet home where his father is and into his welcoming arms john makes the uh, comment jesus message is that uh, god welcomes sinners home with open arms and that's true but he is also showing that our sin is where we start When we set out home, Uh, God can use our sin to then lead us home and grow us. This reminds John of the Apostle Peter, uh, reading Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 34. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times, me three times, that you know me. Jesus knew Peter would would betray him, uh, deny him three times, and yet this would be part of Peter's path to maturing in Christ so that he could teach others to run back to Jesus and know the Father's love more deeply too this is true of us when we sin and turn our backs on god it seems counterintuitive but in this world scarred by sin sin doesn't thwart god's purposes Uh, god means something good by it our greatest sins could be one of the places of our greatest growth in christ and now i come to my next point uh, how to grow when you sin Uh, Like suffering, uh, sin brings a great temptation to run from God as well as a great opportunity uh, to grow towards God. Excusing your sin or trying to make up for it means you're running away from God. Calling out sin for what it is, owning it and fleeing from it into God's presence means that we'll be transformed by it. How, How do we set foot on that pathway to growing in Christ? Having sin before well it is when we see the difference between sin and christ to see that difference we need to see sin for what it is sinful and that it leaves us miserable and hopeless as a result when that happens we see the wonderful majestic kindness of god through jesus and his sweet forgiveness as a result when we hear of him seeing the bad news story of our sin helps us to see that we are in desperate need of change and in the face of Jesus Christ we take the road of repentance home 
The younger son in Jesus' parable testifies to that. Uh, he'd been loved by, by his father. He knew that, yet he went his own way. But it was only a, as he limped home, he showed us he understood his sin and his need of forgiveness. Then he sees his father's response, continuing on with the parable. You could say that at this moment was this moment, his moment of conversion. And when someone becomes a Christian at that is also uh, the way home for every um, sin to the father who loves us d dearly as his children. And that status doesn't change. So John says, as we see our sin, we see Christ running towards us. And as we see Christ, we grow. Not sure about you, but have you ever been at that or at a point, it could have been many a time, uh, where y you think you need to turn to God for wisdom and that if you don't turn to him, then you feel as if you're wa walking away from him and his loving care? Well, if so, that's because it's true. Uh, we have a relationship with God, and if we don't think in this way, then we'll, we'll be running away from Him, and therefore His loving care if we do. This just goes to show that we are His children, and we're meant to draw closer to Him. We know that. I usually shed tears when I see my sin in light of God's amazing love for me. His undeserved favour brings me to my knees, and yet... It is his undeserved favour that sets me on my feet. I think I have appreciated Christ more in my failures. We grow as we see him, that is Jesus. We grow as we think about these truths and grow all the more when we repent and turn once more to our Saviour, Jesus. All this talk about sinning though, uh, should we sin if it helps us grow up in Christ? Do we need to enjoy God's love by sinning and then returning to him in repentance time and time again? Even this parable would suggest no. How so? Well, the younger son only needed to walk out of his room and into his father's presence. His journey was a way of learning the hard way about the goodness of God. It, it, it's about relationship with God. It doesn't depend on how many wayward journeys we go on. Uh, that means we can enjoy God's presence without leaving on a road trip. And now I come to my next point, how to be uh, good and not grow. Uh, sin is not outward waywardness, but inner waywardness that then proceeds to control what we think, say and do. It is turning away from loving God to loving ourselves or other things. So turning to this parable, the younger son's sin didn't start when he left home or even when he wanted his father's inheritance. His sin started when he stopped loving his father. And if we read carefully, he wasn't the only son to have stopped loving his father too. Reading Luke chapter 15 Verses 29 and 30. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed and fattened calf for him. How do we know the older son stopped loving his father? when he starts to talk about his own achievements, like never disobeying anything that his father had commanded. This just goes to show that the older brother sinned, even though he was physically close to his father, and the older son even lived as if he loved his father. This problem is explained in Jeremiah, uh, reading Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Sin does have an outward element to it, but it starts from within us when we stop loving God. Then it can show itself in many and varied ways. 
In this parable, the younger son expressed that he had turned away from his father by asking for his share of the inheritance and going away. And the older brother expressed that he had turned away from his father by loving his own achievements. This really happens. After all, Jesus was telling this story to two groups of people, uh, those who, who, who failed and those who hadn't. Reading Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. This introduction uh, to this chapter tells us that, or how to read the parable. And here it is. The tax collectors turned from God to worship wealth and possessions. And the Pharisees turned from God to worship their self-righteousness. One group came home, though. The tax collectors came home. They were drawing close to Jesus to hear him out. This just goes to show that you're not sinning only when you do wrong, nor are you right just because you do good. And for the purpose of our series on growing as a Christian, a good person is not necessarily a growing person. In fact, a good person can be far from loving. You can never fail and never grow you can fail again and again and grow because of your failures and now i come to my final point Uh, god's love never fails because of the reality of sin in our lives and in this world until jesus returns this means we can use the times when we sin as a means of growing as a christian walking towards christ the key is listening to god who speaks truth to you and all all of us. It will be hard truth and tough love sometimes, uh, but coming from our loving God who has your good at heart and wants to build you up more to be like Jesus, his son. Uh, What we must not be doing is listening to uh, Satan as he lies to us, telling us there is no way that God will freely love you again, that you're too far gone or that you at least need to make it up to God. Satan will claim that he has a better way forward for your life, which is a mistake. You could say that the young son made a mistake as he was walking home in that parable in Luke chapter 15. And I'm reading verses 21 and 22. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Can you hear what's implied here? Well, the son thinks that it's his job to determine who his father would call a son and who he accepts. But the thing is, is that the father makes that call and therefore it it is God himself and no one else who makes that call. We don't need to stay at a distance when it comes to God and our sin. We don't need to work our way back into God's favour. God runs down that road always wanting you to come home. So God's love never fails you. He is there waiting to hear from you as you pray to him, wanting you to enjoy his loving presence. When we have sinned and then draw close to, to God, we grow as a result. We will sin again, even today. When you have run away from God and his ways will keep when you have run away from God and his ways, will you keep on running or will you come back and keep growing, going towards him? When you next sin, ask God to grow you by showing you how empty life is without him. Ask him to remind you of how great his forgiveness is. And ask him to assure you with joy in his presence, living as his children. We're still sinners now, but God determines even our sin will grow us as long as we run to him. This is is the sort of family we're in and the father we have. Let's uh, close in prayer now. Heavenly Father, We thank you for showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Help us to see sin for what it is 
knowing that this helps us see you for who you really are, our wonderful God who saves us through Jesus Christ. May this be especially so when we run away from you so that we know full well that you are waiting for us when we return to enjoy your kindness. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll now watch a video helping us to see the sinfulness of sin in light of God's great kindness toward us, his children. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso, it's like, <laughs> but I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. Well, gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward, but I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. With the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I, I got to admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things or life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, 
that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. You see, it's a process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish, it's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever gonna hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize, heavenward. Oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years. These empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character where you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both. What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away. Just be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not for me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me, I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know, reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just meant, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my gosh. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say 
You want to use me. And I feel so useless. If you'll take me and use me, then God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's gonna be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's... No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. My sin is free.